OK, and we are recording. So um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we've got a few people who joined us, and I know that we have a few people who will be waiting for the recording to come out. So um, this month's uh, ALG featured speaker is Dr. Jason Sloan at Georgia Southern University. Um, he teaches uh, philosophy and religious studies. And um, he's created a really cool open game, open historical game um, called Two Nations, One Land. And I know we are all really excited to hear about the project and um, how you went through it with your grant. All right, well, thank you. I appreciate the introduction. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jason. Um, I do want to point out at the beginning here that my first name is Dom. I go by Jason. Share that is because if you want to communicate with me via email, you know, after this is over, uh, my email address is D Sloan, not J Sloan. So sometimes uh, people try to get a hold of me as J Sloan and it doesn't arrive. So, anyway, so thank you all for joining me today. Um, I'm excited to share my experiences and share my game and and um, answer any questions you might have, whether it's about, um, you know, role playing games in general or open ed resources or anything, you know, the content of the game, namely you know, the question of Israel, um, et cetera. So um, before I get started, I have a quick sort of survey question for folks uh, in the audience. I can't see everyone because I'm uh, sharing my screen, but um, how many, about how many of you have some experience with like reacting to the past games or some kind of role-playing games? I'm trying to, to, to get a sense of, you know, how much to share about uh, role-playing games. Maybe you could answer in the chat and Tiffany could share that information verbally. I mean, are, folks, are, are most of the folks here familiar with uh, reacting to the past or open uh, uh, role-playing games or, or not really, or thinking about trying them, have heard about them, uh, et cetera? So we've, um, so we've got one person who says um, they have observed one once and um, okay. We have Lucy has had um, some experience. Of course, she okay. is the executive director of Galileo, so she's seen all of the cool projects coming out of our grant pro programs. Yeah, gotcha. Um, we have someone who's participated in one with you on mm. Ancient Athens. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. okay. And um, and then Jeff has uh, some experience with reacting and too much experience with games, he says. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. All right, uh, that that's helpful. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, my game is called Two Nations, One Land, and it's really centered uh, in 1947 um, on the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine, which became known as the UNSCOP, uh, and the question uh, of what to do about uh, the, pal the the land that was controlled by the British after World War One, um, and basically you have two groups of people. Um, we have Zionists uh, that are hopeful uh, to, to, to get a country of their own in, in the wake of World War II and the Nazi genocide and the Holocaust. And then you also have on the other side, um, Arabs of Palestine um, who are hopeful that the land will become theirs. Um, and so basically you have two, two nations of people claiming um, rights to the same land and then the United Nations basically uh, intervenes to to try to come up with a solution. So, um, all right, let me give you a little background context on why I wrote the game and um, why the game is designed the way it is. I have been playing reacting to the past games in class since about 2018 at Georgia Southern. Uh, and I was introduced to our TTP games through this book, Minds on Fire, uh, written by Mark Carnes, who's at Barnard College in New York. And, and he sort of is was credited as the inventor of this pedagogy, although there are you know, lots of role-playing games, other kinds of learning games out there. Uh, reacting to the past is, was my entrance into this pedagogy. And, and I first learned about it um, from uh, participating in a, in a book study with uh, our Center for T Teaching Excellence group at Georgia Southern. But prior to 2018, I actually had a lot of experience in instructional design, instructional technology. I had a really unique career um, experience at a small private school in Ohio before I came to Georgia Southern. Uh, I was a professor there and then I became a department chair and then they started 
a, a, a new college within that university. Um, and that college was to offer uh, all of our programs completely online. And this was back in um, 2009, 2010 uh, academic year. So it was pretty early into the online learning space. And so I was hired to be the dean and I had to basically uh, build that college from the ground up, starting with building a team. And so um, I was able to work closely with instructional designers, instructional technologists and assessment specialists, in addition to the faculty. So it was a really wonderful experience. So and I've and ever since then, I've been really interested in um, pedagogy and science of teaching and learning and instructional design. And I'm always interested in ways to make my uh, my class is more interesting, and um, these role-playing games uh, I have found to be very effective. So if you're thinking about trying reacting to past games or any kind of role-playing games in class, I encourage you to do so. It's scary at first, but then once you do it, it's like, you know, you, you don't ever want to go back to a so-called traditional way of learning. So um, anyway, so I've been doing reacting to the, uh, to the past uh, in my classes. I teach uh, in philosophy and religious studies at Georgia Southern. I love teaching lower level classes, so I'm always begging to teach the intros, which works out pretty well sometimes in our department because lots of folks would rather teach upper level, uh, more specialized courses. But I just love classes like world religions. You know, um, I like working with first year students, and um, and so I've been I've been using uh, games in my world religions class. Um, I use a game to teach Christianity and Greco Roman religion. I use a game set in the fourth century called Constantine and the Council of Nicaea. It's a wonderful way to, to learn for students to learn about Judaism, to learn about Christianity, early Christianity, the early church, to learn about uh, Greco-Roman religions. Um, it's a wonderful game. Uh, and then a second game I've used is a game on India set in 1945 uh, and centered around, you know, the British leaving India. And so leader Indian leaders have to get together and, and really form a country. And um, as hopefully I'm, I'm sure you all know that eventually leads to partition of India into Pakistan. Um, and so there's a game on that. So it's a way for students to learn about Hinduism, Sikhism, uh, Islam. And then uh, I use a game uh, set in, um, in China uh, uh, around the Emperor Wan Li. Um, and so that's a wonderful way for students to learn about uh, Confucianism and a little bit of Taoism. And then in other classes, I've used games on Darwin. I teach a religion and science class. And I uh, play a game on uh, Darwin and the Darwinian revolution and biology. And, and I play another game um, uh, based on Galileo and uh, the Copernican revolution, uh, the trial of Galileo, it's called. Um, and I've uh, and I've played a variety of other games, a game on South Africa and so forth. Anyway, so I, I tell you this because uh, there are wonderful games, uh, um, but I felt like there was a curriculum gap uh, in the game offerings. I wanted to, to teach students uh, about uh, Israel and the ongoing conflict, and there just wasn't a game on Israel. And so um, in talking with some veteran uh, game writers like Mark Carnes and, and Nick Proctor and, and others, um, you know, I, was, I said, you know, we need a game on Israel. And everybody said, yeah, we do. You should write it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, typical academic stuff, right? Um, and so I said, well, well, I can't write a game on Israel. I'm not an expert in this area. This is not my field. And to my surprise, Nick Proctor, who has written a book on game design, said to me, Jason, that's even better. If you're not an expert, your game will end up being more playable for students. Because if you, the challenge is if you're an expert in a field, you, 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 you know so many of the details that the games can become, games written by experts um, can, can become overwhelming for students because there's so much detail and so much material. So he said, yeah, you should think about writing a game on Israel, you know, just make a basic intro, like, you know, uh, intro level game, start with that, and then you can build on it over the years. So I was thinking about it, thinking about it, and then I saw an, an announcement came out for uh, an Affordable Learning Georgia grant initiative uh, in partnership with uh, um, the Reacting to the Past Consortium, and they were looking for folks to write games. And I thought, well, you know what, I'll, I'll submit an application and we'll see what happens. And so I submitted a grant application and, um, and actually uh, was selected to receive a grant. And so that was my um, oh crap moment, like, oh man, wow, now I really actually have to write this game. And so, um, but it's been a wonderful experience. Uh, it's been challenging. I'll share some of the challenges I've had, uh, but it's also been quite thrilling 
in a way that other scholarly activities I've pursued have not been. You know, I've written a monograph, I've done edited collections and been an editor for journal and 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 run experimental studies and I've done a variety of scholarly activities, but this was probably the most, one of the most challenging, but also one of the most fun and most rewarding uh, things I've ever done. So I encourage you if you're thinking about doing something um, to do so. It's it's a it's a really, f uh, as I said, ch challenging but fun and rewarding initiative. So, so that's the background. Um, so really, I'm writing I, because of the curriculum gap. The, my main goal was to write a game that I could use in my world religions class, um, and then maybe other upper level classes to teach students about um, the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, because a lot of uh, the way I teach world religions is not sort of the, just the theology of all different religions, but their socio-political um, histories as well. And so we do a lot of lived religion kind of stuff. And so if you want to teach Judaism or Islam, you know, their Israeli conflict is a, is a really powerful way to do that. So there's some context. Um, the other thing is I had lots of help doing this project. I was definitely not alone. There was a team. Um, I got a lot of help from veterans like Mark and Nick and Jen Worth and and at US excuse me at UGA Chase and Naomi were wonderful supportive help helpers. Um, it's a little goofy on the format there, but for the Georgia Southern Center for Teaching Excellence, uh, Claudia Corneo Appel was very helpful with design and instructional design kinds of things. She eventually left right in the middle of the project, taking a job elsewhere. So I lost her halfway through, but she'd already contributed quite a bit uh, in helping me. Um, and I'll, I'm gonna save Nikki for last, but uh, I reached out to some subject matter experts at Georgia Southern and the history department, Ahmed, Dr. Uh, Ahmed Akhturk was very helpful. He's a Middle Eastern scholar. And then uh, a, a guy who was really super helpful was Elad ben Dror, who's written widely on UNSCOP. He's probably the leading UNSCOP scholar in the world. He's in Israel and he was very helpful with me. Share, he just, he shared all kinds of, really helpful materials with me. So, um, and then I actually got um, a small grant from our college at Georgia Southern University, the College of Arts and Humanities. And I was able to hire three undergraduate uh, students. They were, all three were majors in our department and they uh, got a small stipend to help me with some of the research as research assistants. So Noah, Connor, and James were really helpful. All three of those students are in graduate school now. So uh, maybe the experience, uh, you know, working on this project kind of motivated them to take the next step. So, and then last, but definitely not least was um, I got library uh, resources and open education resources support from Nikki Rich in our uh, Statesboro campus library. Uh, she was very helpful with understanding uh, the complexities of OER, things like copyright and um, sustainability of online resources and, and very complicated things that I, I didn't know a lot about. And so I learned a lot from her and uh, I'll be happy to share more about OER if that's something people are interested in learning more about. But the idea with Open Ed Resources and this grant program, uh, in case y'all don't know, I'm, maybe you do, but is, is that we want to design materials that students can use uh, for free. Um, so they, we're reducing their expenses, you know, how much it costs them to, to get an education. And so one of the ways you can, um, you know, offer free books, so to speak, is to, is to write materials, but also to gather materials that exist online. Um, but doing that's actually a very complicated thing because, uh, as I said, some, you have to be, be aware of copyright issues and you have to be mindful of uh, the fact that websites will go down or some of them are unreliable um, and so forth and so on. So Nikki was very, very helpful with that piece of the puzzle. So I, I say this, you know, because it was a big project, but um, I was not alone and, and I had just wonderful help from lots of people. So, okay, uh, quick uh, look at the timeline. I um, started in spring of 19 doing uh, research and drafting uh, a, a sort of outline for game design. And when I say research, it was both subject matter research, you know, the characters, the setting, the background, but also research on gaming and game design in a classroom. That part was actually really fun. The other part of learning was very helpful because I learned a lot about uh, the the issue and the topic that I didn't know before. So that was pretty cool too. Um, but then I, and by the end of the spring, I drafted sort of a very rough version of the game. Uh, and then in the summer of 19, I went down to uh, reacting to the past game design conference, which was supported, this travel was supported by the grant. 
and was able to do a mini workshop on my game and got lots of wonderful feedback from uh, game designers, veteran game designers in the reacting community, in the gameplay community. And so after that, I came back and finished uh, really the second the version 2.0 of the game and play tested it in the fall of 19. Um, and I play tested in two different classes. So that was really helpful because it, the game actually played out differently in the two different classes. In one class, um, nobody won. <laughs> the whole thing fell apart, which kind of mirrors the real world uh, in some ways. And then in the other class, the Zionists won. So it was interesting to see how the game uh, played out in two different classes. And then in December, uh, after getting feedback from students, I revised the games, uh, revised the game a third time, and then I got ready uh, for playing the game at the Reacting to the Past Winter Conference in Athens at, U at UGA in January. I um, was very fortunate to be able to have offer my game as one of the games for folks. And so faculty members came and played the game. And that was really, really helpful because I got all kinds of just wonderful feedback. But the most important feedback I got was that the game didn't fall apart. It didn't collapse. It actually held together. And so then I got feedback from everybody and then wrote a fourth version uh, in the, for the spring classes and was getting ready to play the, the, the games uh, in the spring classes when COVID hit and uh, all of our classes went online and so we didn't get a chance to play that. So, and then in this, uh, this past summer, uh, I revised again to a, a sort of a 5.0 version, added the instructor manual um, and submitted to the USG so that now folks can, uh, can have access to the game and, and play it. Um, so that's been sort of the timeline, the materials, the main materials, the game book. And the game book uh, includes just an overview of what, you know, our, you know, reacting games are like, role-playing games are like, an overview of the, the game itself, a lot on historical background, um, role sheets. Uh, I have classes of 35, so there are 35 role sheets, um, individual roles for students to play. I have some ideas for more roles if I ever teach larger classroom cl classes, um, but for, for now I have 35. I've created a quiz. There's a team quiz competition, which I'll tell you about, and then a couple of appendices for students, for additional resources, um, and so forth. And then I created some PowerPoint slides for um, for basically doing game prep. So if any faculty members wanted to play this game, there, you know, there's some PowerPoint slides to kind of help. They're very basic, but and then the instructor manual. Um, so if you want to play the game, that this was what these are the materials you'll get, um, and that should be sufficient. To, to play a game. If you have a class of more than 35 students um, and you're interested in playing this game, contact me and we can talk about some additional role sheets because I have some other characters in mind I think would be good characters for the game, but I don't need more than 35 and can't use more than 35. So I have not written those role sheets yet, but okay. So now, uh, are there any questions so far or should I just keep going? So now I was gonna get into the actual game itself. We don't have any in the chat yet. Um, okay. But why, why don't I just jump into the game and we'll get through the game and then maybe save all the questions for the end and we can just all knock them out at one time. How about that? Sounds good. Okay. So here is the game setting. So basically I was looking to write a game that would allow students to learn about, you know, what's, what's going on in Israel today and how did we get there? And so, I mean, where do you start on that history? A lot of people go to the late 1800s with the rise of Zionism to teach that history. Some people start with World War I um, and uh, the, 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 um, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the French and the British, you know, basically carving up the, um, the so-called Middle East and, and, and taking control of different countries and the British taking control of Palestine under the British mandate, which is... Um, approved by the League of Nations. Some people then start at um, World War II as a place to start talking about that. We start with the Holocaust. And um, so you can start with, you know, teaching this material in, in, a, in a variety of different ways. I chose to write a game um, with the setting of Palestine in 1947. Because what has happened at this point in history is, um, you know, World War II is over. And Zionists are very eager, um, obviously, to 
try to get a country of their own, given what happened to them in the Holocaust and World War II. And um, so they had been moving uh, into the in, into Palestine, um, you know, by the tens of thousands before, during, and after the war. And so, the, but the British uh, are in control of Palestine through the mandate, and they're not sure what to do because this is, and obviously the local Arabs are upset by um, Zionists coming in and, from the Arab perspective, colonizing the land. And the British are getting hammered by both sides. The Arabs are mad at the British because they're allowing Zionists to come in. And so the British, um, they restrict immigration and the Zionists become then angry at the British and, and, and start fighting. And they, you know, they bomb a hotel in Jerusalem where the British officers are living. So it's a very ugly situation by 1947. And so the British basically throw their hands up in the air and they say, we don't want to we don't want to be here anymore. And there was also some pressure from the United States for the British to begin unwinding all of their colonial projects. Um, you know, the British were in debt to the U.S. because of the war and and the U.S. is um, putting pressure on, as, as I said, putting pressure on Britain to leave. So um, the British turned to the recently formed United Nations and they say, basically, you deal with this problem. You 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 tell us what should happen. Um, we we kind of want to leave, but um, why don't why, why don't the UN you know you decide what to do? So the United Nations, which is a fairly new organization, uh, forms a committee um, to look into the problem and make recommendations to the General Assembly about what to do about the so-called problem of Palestine and the question of Israel. And so that committee they form is called the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine, or UNSCOP. And this is the the committee here. Okay. Okay, so the way the game is set up then is pretty straightforward. You have on one side, the, you have Zionists are trying to um, convince the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine to recommend the creation of a state, a national homeland for them. On the other side, you have Arabs of Palestine who are trying to convince UNSCOP not to do that. And for the British and the Arabs of Palestine are trying to convince the UNSCOP to recommend um, for the British to leave and the mandate and for the Arabs to take control of the country um, as had been happening elsewhere in the Middle East. Um, Arabs and other parts and Arabs and Persians, other parts of the Middle East had gotten their own countries, so to speak. And so Arabs of Palestine are wanting that as well. And so then you, the indeterminate group is this UNSCOP committee. It consists of 11 members plus this guy, Dr. Ralph Bunch, which I'll talk about here in a sec. But basically the game is the Zionists are trying to convince the UNSCOP to vote for Israel, a Jewish homeland. The Arabs are trying to convince UNSCOP to do the opposite. UNSCOP is trying to figure out what's a fair and um, sustainable solution. And so the victory conditions are pretty straightforward. The Zionists win if UNSCOP gives them a country. In that case, Arabs will lose. Arabs will win if UNSCOP's if UNSCOP votes not to create a state for Israel, for Zionists, for Jews, and instead uh, creates Palestine, um, and here's the here's the tension in the game. This is very common game design. UNSCOP is trying to come up with a solution that both sides will agree to. So you can imagine the tension that is built into that game design. And then there's a fourth group, um, a group of journalists who are observing all of the events. Uh, the gameplay, they're interviewing students, they're doing interviews, um, they're taking notes in the game, and then they give, and then throughout the game, they actually give reports on what's happening. And then as we're going to see, uh, the journalists, uh, want, there are three journalists, one is going to be a so-called neutral journalist writing just the facts, uh, trying not to be biased, but one journalist is pro-Zionist and one journalist is pro-Arab. And the reason I built that into the game design is because um, we, I want them to think a lot about media bias and, and reporting. So um, all three journalists throughout the game will give reports on what's been happening, and it becomes very obvious what media bias looks like. And so that's a pretty interesting part of the game as well. So that's the basic game. It's pretty straightforward. Zionists are trying to win. Arabs are trying to win. UNSCOP's trying to uh, come up with a solution, uh, some kind of solution that'll please both sides, which is obviously very difficult to do. Okay. Um, so here are the characters uh, on the Arabs of Pal Palestine. They also are known as the Arab Higher Committee. So sometimes the students will refer to themselves as the AOP, sometimes refer to themselves as the AHC. 
technically by this time in, uh, in history, the AHC had been dissolved kind of, it's a complicated situation, but to keep it simple for an intro level game, I just called this team, the AOP, the Arabs Palestine. And then here's what I want to point out. There's, so it's not, once you get into play, you realize the Arabs are not a unified team. There's actually there are disagreements within the group, and that adds another layer of complexity to the game, and that matches, you know, history. Um, you had about you had about five or six or seven Arab leaders who absolutely were hardliners, who were they were very conservative uh, on the issue, and they were they refused to compromise. So their position is um, no Israel. The whole place, the whole land, you know, the whole country has to be Palestine, and they're not willing to compromise whatsoever. But there are other Arab leaders, these four that, you know, we classify as moderates in that, you know, they saw the writing on the wall. They basically realized, look, um, it is highly unlikely that the UN is not going to um, find some way to carve out a nation state for, uh, for Jews, for the Zionists. And so their strategy was, if there's going to be some kind of a two-state solution, they began lobbying to, to, to make that two-state solution as favorable to Arabs as possible. So this group, there, there ends up being a fight within the group over strategy and voting and so forth, because these hardliners refuse to compromise. It's all or nothing. Whereas these four are trying to, are willing to compromise as long as they can convince the UN, you know, to give two thirds of the land to Arabs, for example, because that is equivalent to the demographic ratio. Two thirds of the population are Arab, one third are, are, are Jews. So, um, so they end up, so this group ends up having to convince this group as well as the United Nations. And so there's that. And that mirrors history um, roughly. And I'll talk a little bit of, at the end about the challenges of writing games that and staying true to history. But um, so that's the Arabs of Palestine team. The Zionist team, um, these are the characters in the Zionist team. And I added this uh, additional member of the team, John Stanley Gruel, uh, because he actually is an evangelical Christian and he's an American and he basically uh, has some kind of call. He feels called to use Christian language. He feels called to go uh, to Palestine and, and lobby and fight on behalf of the Zionists. The Zionists. And um, many historians will say he was actually very instrumental in, in the UN deciding to, to create it, to uh, approve the creation of the state of Israel um, because he was an American Christian. And so, and I've added him into the game um, because uh, I want to give, you know, we want to educate students to understand that the Zionists, uh, that's a political movement. Um, not necessarily a religious movement per se. So a lot of these uh, characters, these Zionists, were actually secular Jews, but they're also Christian Zionists. And we, and during the postmortem, we talk about Christian Zionism in, in uh, 2020 as well. So, and the other thing I, I forgot to mention about the Arabs of Palestine is some of these characters are Marxists. Some of them are secular um, Arabs. Some of them are Muslims, and some of them um, are Christians. And so that also complicates that simplistic narrative that a lot of students have that this is a fight between Jews and Muslims over religion. It's much more complicated than that. So, okay. And then the indeterminate group is UNSCOP. And the way UNSCOP was put together by the UN was pretty interesting. Um, they didn't want any of the big major players emerging in the Cold War to have too much influence on the recommendations. And so the US was not put on the committee. Uh, Great Britain was not put on the committee, the UK. Um, Russia was not put on the committee, uh, et cetera. So it was quote unquote 11 neutral countries. But not surprisingly, many, you know, some of the members, a good number of the members of the committee had biases going into the, the committee work. Um, Justice Ivan Rand from Canada, Jorge Granados and Enrique Fabregat from Guatemala and Uruguay were both pro-Zionists. Um, all those three were all uh, pro-Zionist going into the committee. Um, now they were told to put aside any biases and have an open mind and and try to be fair and 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 so forth, but we know basically from historical documents they were biased. And on the other side, you had two members uh, of the UNSCOP that were pro-Arab. You had Sir Abdur Rahman from India and Nasrullah Tazam from uh, Iran. That they were both pro uh, excuse me, pro-Arab. 
and uh, pro-Palestinian and um, and but then you do have about six members of the committee that were more or less trying to be neutral and you can tell from their journals and that kind of thing so so anyway this sets up a similar kind of dynamic on the committee itself where um, you have Rahman and Entizam that are going to argue uh, for um, for Palestine and you got three members that are going to argue for uh, Israel but then you have six that are sort of um, undecided and these three these six end up having a lot of the power in the game because depending on which way they break is how the game uh, plays out and then the final member um, of the game uh, of this excuse me of this uh, faction is Dr. Ralph Bunch and he is a is an American diplomat and I'm really excited to have his role in the game uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, and I, and I, I can talk at length about those if you have questions about his role, but he's an American diplomat, first African-American to get a PhD, uh, I think in history or political science from Harvard and a, a brilliant ambassador diplomat. He eventually wins the Nobel Peace Prize for his work uh, on the Arab-Israeli conflict. Um, but he has a special role in the game. He basically runs the game. His title is, special liaison to UNSCOP, but he's a non, he's not a member of the committee and he doesn't vote, but he's sort of his job, so to speak, is to make, to, is to make it happen, is for, for the UNSCOP to make a decision because the challenge for UNSCOP was they just get bogged down and they can't make a decision because no matter what decision they make, it's a lose-lose kind of a decision. If you vote to create Israel, then that's going to enrage the Palestinians, the Arabs. And if you vote not to create Israel, well, that looks like anti-Semitism, which is, you know, would be a very difficult position to take, given what had just happened in World War II to Jews in Europe. And so, and this happened in both of the games I play tested, is UNSCOP just gets bogged down and it's almost, you know, they get analysis paralysis. They can't make a decision. And, and this was true in, in real history, that UNSCOP, just kept kicking the can down the road. They couldn't come to a decision. And Ralph Bunch's job is just to get them to make a decision, basically. And so um, he he's very uh, important in the game in that he's constantly working with all three sides. So he's kind of the liaison between all three parties, because in the game, the Arabs are not talking to Zionists and the Zionists are not talking to the Arabs. And so he, so he will do things like deliver secret messages back and forth. So like one member of the Arab team might want to float a proposal to the Zionists to see how they would, you know, feel about it. Well, they're not going to say that in public, obviously, for obvious reasons. So they will write a note and, and Ralph Bunch will deliver it in secret, sometimes outside of class. The other thing Ralph Bunch does is he comes up with, he floats ideas that of his own to the UNSCOP members, you know, and say, hey, UNSCOP, have you thought about this as a possibility? And so basically his his job, he's not a voting member of UNSCOP, but his job is to is to try to figure out solutions. And then the final piece of this is, <laughs> um, for those of you who have played games or run games, you'll probably giggle at this, but, you know, he is, he's the, he's the um, person that the game master, the professor can talk to. So the game master can kind of manipulate the game and guide it back and forth in different directions by floating ideas to Ralph Bunch for him to deliver uh, to UNSCOP or other members of the game. Um, and, uh, and so he has a very important role in the game. And basically, um, the victory conditions for UNSCOP is they're trying to come up with a solution that both sides will agree to in some way. And Ralph Bunch wins the game. He wins if... Uh, if UNSCOP, if after the UNSCOP vote uh, for recommendations, if both sides don't basically walk out um, and accept the recommendations. So he, he has a very difficult kind of job. I can show you his role sheet if, if, if anybody's interested in learning more about Dr. Bunch, but it's really, it was really pretty cool to have his role in the game because you also send the message um, to students about, you know, this important, uh, person in in global history but also a, a very high achieving african-american um, scholar and ambassador and diplomat a uh, very powerful person 
And a lot of, you know, a third of our students are African-American at Georgia Southern. And some of the students came up to me after the game and said, I have never even heard of this guy. He's an amazing, what an amazing human being. How come I never heard of him? So it's pretty cool that students learn about him as a person too. So, okay. And then you have three journalists and the way it's set up, and this is a little bit gamey. Um, they, uh, in history, that it's not this clear, but um, one journalist, this is Claire Hollingworth in the game. She, she's British and in the game, she's, uh, supposed to be writing on the UNSCOP work for The Economist, and she's supposed to be neutral. Then you have Emil Tuma, who's uh, an Arab, and he's in the game he's writing for the newspaper, the Al Ijtihad. And then you have, uh, and he's pro-Arab, so he's biased a bit in his in his coverage of the events. And then you have Ruth Gruber, she's an American, she's Jewish, and she in, in the game she's uh, supposed to be writing for the New York Herald. And the reason I, in the, in the way this is set up is then, when students hear, you know, reports from three different reporters about what's going on, it's very clear what media bias looks like. You know, Claire Hollingworth will report on events, and then Emil Tuma will report on events, and his report is so different from hers. You know, he'll talk about his reports. Will talk about, um, you know, how the UN is is you know not paying attention and not listening to Arab concerns, and then Ruth Gruber will give her report on the same issue, and it will be the opposite. And so. And then, as we'll talk about here in a second, in the postmortem, um, we'll talk about what to what degree is this stuff fake news. So, okay, so again, there's the setup. So they watch and interview students. Students get extra credit if they end up in any of the journalist reports. So they're motivated to be interviewed. And also, the Zionists are trying to manipulate, you know, opinion, public opinion, by planting stories. The Arabs are trying to manipulate through Emil Tuma's writing, etc. So, so basically, the way the game plays out is they're I've set it up for 10 sessions, three are prep. We'll do a day on uh, Jewish history. Again, it's an intro class. So this is literally, you know, Genesis to Zionism kind of thing. <laughs> I know it's silly, but most of the learning in these games take place during the play, not the prep. It's just enough prep to get them to be able to play. The second day we do Islamic Arab, Arab history, you know, again, Ibrahim or Muhammad to the Ottoman Empire kind of thing. And then we look specifically in the third class about 19th, 20th century socio-political history. You know, we look at the, we look at World War One, the League of Nations, the end of the Ottoman Empire, the British Mandate, the World War II, the Holocaust, the creation of the UN, et cetera. And then I do a team quiz competition. Um, so there's a quiz in a game book and I put them in teams and whichever team wins gets a pretty cool prize. I'll show you that here in a sec. And then we start gameplay. And it's pretty straightforward. The first session of play, the group is debating what option A. And option A in the game is all Palestine. So one option that Dunscop could vote is no Israel. And so there'll be speeches by Arabs on this. Obviously, they're in favor of that. And then there'll be speeches by the uh, Zionists against that. And then the second, and then there's debate. So there's their speeches for about 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and then debate and discussion, uh, sort of open debate and discussion for 30 minutes or so. Second class, the same, same idea, but in this class, it's option B, uh, all Israel, no Palestine. And during once the second class session starts, the journalists begin reading their reports at the beginning of class. So in, in this class, they all the journalists will report on what happened in this first session. And then in this class, the journalists report on what happened in that session and so forth. So it's kind of like you have class on Tuesday, and on Thursday, the, the, the journalists report what happened back on Tuesday. So these are one state solution options for UNSCOP to consider. And then the, the last two classes um, are uh, option C and option D, two state solutions, one nation with two provinces or states. And by the way, during this session, I make an announcement about current events. Um, this is, uh, and I announce uh, the SS Exodus incident. I don't know if you know this, but um, uh, basically during this period, Br the British had restricted immigration uh, of Zionists into Palestine and a whole bunch of uh, hundreds of displaced persons from the Nazi camps um, got on, bought a boat, a large ship, the SS Exodus, and sailed it to Palestine and were looking to disembark. And the British denied them and turned them back and sent them back to Europe. And so it was a very ugly situation. There was actually a fight that broke out. Um, so, but I announced that current event there. So they debate option C. Then the fourth class, they debate option D, and that is partition. And then I make a second announcement, and I tell them what had recently happened in India with the partition, where nearly a million people died 
and the ongoing partition. Because by this time, it's pretty clear that the, a one-state solution is not going to be an option. Uh, Unscop's going to vote down that. There's the, the only real option is some kind of two-state solution. And they always lean towards, well, we'll just partition. We'll just create two nations. Simple solution. Everybody gets a land. And that's when I hit them with the Indian partition and how ugly partition can be. And that you know, complicates the thing. And then after option D, I announce who won the team quiz and whichever team wins, they can eliminate any of these options. So if the Zionists win the quiz, they can eliminate option A. So then UNSCOP has no ability to vote for option A. And if the, if the uh, Arabs win, they can eliminate option B. And if UNSCOP wins, um, they can uh, eliminate any of these options from consideration. So, all right. And then the fifth game of gameplay. So this whole time it's been Arabs and, and, and Zionists talking, speaking, debating. And UNSCOP has basically been asking questions, uh, trying to get information and clarifying and so forth, sort of serving as like a committee. And then in the final class, the, the fifth class, all of the UNSCOP members deliver speeches outlining what how they are going to vote. So basically, you know, Ivan Ram from Canada stands up and says, you know, I've heard all of these debates. And after giving careful consideration, I've decided I'm going to vote for option C and here's why. And then, um, you know, Fabregat gets up and gives his speech and tells what he's planning to do. So basically, they're revealing their cards. It's a game design. And then they open it for discussion and lobbying. So now everybody in the room knows how UNSCOP is leaning. And then I tell them, so if this happens on, say, a Thursday or a Tuesday, if it happens on a Tuesday, I say, okay, when we come back, you're going to vote. So then both sides have two days to lobby the UNSCOP members outside of class to try to get them to change their votes or whatever. And, the, and so there's a lot of outside class activity that goes on. And you can do that through apps like GroupMe or, or other apps where you can record this stuff and use it as you know, part of their particip participation grade or whatever if you want to. So, so the last day, there's the final discussion, more lobbying, and then finally, oops, that's a typo, sorry, UNSCOP votes. And then once UNSCOP votes, the Arabs and the, Re and the Zionists both get to vote whether or not they agree with the UNSCOP recommendations. And so again, the UNSCOP goal is to get both, a majority of both sides to agree to it. So let's say uh, UNSCOP votes for option C, then we'll turn it over and say, okay, Arabs, how many of you agree, are willing to agree to option C? And if a majority of them do, then that's a partial win for UNSCOP. And then they'll, and then we'll turn it to the uh, Israelis and say that to the Zionists and say, how many of you would agree to option C? And if a majority of them do, then the UNSCOP members win the game. And here's then the fine, the twist at the end of the game. It doesn't matter what UNSCOP recommends because I am, uh, that's another typo. I apologize. That's the UN, the general, the game master is the United Nations. So when UNSCOP says we have voted for option C or option B or option D, it doesn't matter. I, as the United Nations say, well, thank you for your recommendations, but it doesn't matter. You're just an advisory committee. And this really ticks them off. And then I have a fun conversation with them about how academic faculty governance works, <laughs> how faculty senates are advisory boards only and, you know, systems do kind of whatever they want to do. Um, and, um, and no matter what UNSCOP chooses, whether it's A, B, C, or D, as the UN, I'm going to vote to pass Resolution 181, which was the actual resolution passed. Um, and um, and, and that's, this is what the map then is going to look like. And then I tell them, then we have a, a, a conversation about how this is what happened in real history. UNSCOP made some recommendations to the United Nations. The United Nations General Assembly uh, took input from lots uh, of people, including the United States, who lobbied for partition. And Resolution 181 ended up with Israel getting two thirds of the land, um, even though they were only one third of the population. So the blue is Israel, and the, uh, the, the orange was supposed to be the Arab state. And then we talk about, then we start the debriefing process, the post mortem. We talk about this was the 47 borders. There's an immediate war, Arabs attack. Um, back and forth and we talk about the war and then by 49 when the war ends you can see that 
Israelis have taken more land and the borders have changed. So Arabs have lost territory. And we talk about the Nakba, where uh, Arab refugees have to flee and go into Syria and Jordan, uh, where they live in refugee camps to this day. And then they come back and they think, oh, okay, we're going to start our next unit. And surprise, surprise, I have a new game for them. And this is a game design. It's a one-class micro game. We flash forward to 1967. So this is 49. And then they come back to class, say, on the next Tuesday. And I say, guess what? We're playing a new game. And here's the new game. Uh, Egypt, Jordan, Syria just attacked Israel. Uh, the war is June of 67. The war lasts six days. And Israel wins the war and in the process takes control of all of this territory. The Sinai Peninsula. Gaza, West Bank, even uh, part of Syria, the Golan Heights. So this is the new border of Israel. Here's the new micro game. Your, so the, the group that were the Zionists are now Israelis. The groups that were Arabs are, are still Arabs, but the, the UNSCOT committee is now the UN. And um, there's a micro game where is, the Israelis have to convince the UN that these are legitimate borders now because they won this territory fair and square. And oh, by the way, they were attacked first. And then the Arabs have to convince the UN to tell Israel to go back to the original borders of 49. And then the UN has to decide what to do. And then that sets us up. So they play that game uh, just for one class session. So that's the game. Here's uh, the Zionists in this particular class were, were uh, pretty enthusiastic. They bought flags and they made signs. The group in the middle, here's the UN. You can see this kid's like, oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm going to do kind of thing. Um, and then in the postmortem, we talk about a lot of issues. One of the things we talk about are the journalist reports. And then I show them like this media bias chart and just give them a heads up on, you know, if you're reading Fox News, it's going to be biased in this direction. You know, if you're reading CNN, it's going to be here um, and, and so forth. And so we have a discussion about media bias and in particular coverage of the current events in Israel and Palestine. And then we talk about how we got from 1947 to today. We talk about the rise of the PLO, the Camp David Accords, which results in the assassination of Egyptian President Sadat by the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, and they, the Brotherhood gets jailed. One of the leaders is this guy, Zawahiri, who later partners with bin Laden to form Al-Qaeda. Um, we talk about the Intifadas, the rise of Hamas, the Oslo Accords, and then the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin um, by an Israeli hardliner. And then we bring it up to today, their Israeli settlements and how the U.S. Finally, just recently changed its position on the settlements under the Trump administration. Historically, the U.S. and the U.N. have said these Israeli settlements are illegal. Um, these are settlements in the Arab territories and Palestinian territories. And uh, but Trump has changed that position. So anyway, this is how we get. So the last thing I'll talk about and I'll shut up. We can ask, uh, talk about some questions. Some challenges I had with the game, I'll be honest with you, the biggest challenge was just the nature of the topic. It's so heated. It's so charged. You know, my my department chair, she's a wonderful chair, and I could just feel her. She was so nervous and, you know, concerned. Uh, you know, she, she's a wonderful chair, and I know she was just like, oh, Jason, are you sure you want to do this? Do you know what you're getting into? And, you know, a lot of people said to me, this is a no-win situation. This is the third rail, you know. If you're if you think Israel is a bunch of terrorists, then your game is going to look like it's anti-Arab. And if you think that, you know, if you think the Arabs are a bunch of terrorists then it's going to look like it's or, it's that, or, or vice versa. Sorry. Um, and, and and that's a, that's been a real challenge. I'm still nervous to play the game, you know, in our culture today where students want safe spaces and uh, students are you know engaging in call out cancel culture. I'm you know still nervous that some student will record something in class and post it on social media. Um, and the other thing is that some of these characters in the game were racists. Um, you know, some of the Zionists were paternalists. They thought the Arabs were a bunch of backward, um, you know, um, backward people that couldn't develop a civilization. And so the Zion, you know, Israel was a gift to the Arabs because otherwise they never would have developed their nation because they were incapable of that. And on the other side, you had Arabs like, um, you know, the, the, the most complicated character is Amin al-Husseini, who was a Nazi sympathizer. So that was a real challenge. Um, and then the other challenge is game design. Um, to what degree should the game match real history? And to what degree should the game be a game? You know, in real history, most historians will say there was no way the Arabs could win. 
Um, it was just the deck was stacked against them because of the nature of the United Nations, mostly the pressure of the United States. Um, and um, Truman was very pro-Zionist and very open about it. So should I, you know, I didn't know if I should build the game in a way that Arabs could win or not. You know, that was a challenge. And then the last challenge was the the resources. You know, Nikki said, Jason, it's okay to use Wikipedia. And I was like, no, we can't do that. Wait till my colleagues find out I've used Wikipedia, you know, that kind of thing. And we tell students to never use Wikipedia and here I am using it, you know. But she uh, educated me on that topic and I ended up feeling more comfortable with using Wikipedia. But um, ongoing, you know, keeping up with open ed resources will be an ongoing challenge. So, okay, I'm gonna stop there and take questions. Okay, um, wow, that <laughs> that was amazing. There's so so much information here and I feel like I learned so much. I feel like I took the class. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> That's amazing. So, um, so we have, uh, we had a question that you um, started to answer um, from Lucy who says, okay. um, that she was going to ask about the issues and tensions arising from yeah. uh, students bringing their own preconceptions into the class. And so you brought up how that was a challenge. Oh, yeah. um, I'm going to add on to this question. Did you see any, did you have any issues arise from it and how did you handle them? I did. Um, and I used Ralph Bunch to be honest with you, there are a couple of class sessions where it got pretty heated and, and it started to get ugly. And, and I pulled Ralph Bunch, the, the student who was playing Ralph Bunch to the side. And I said, you need to call a recess right now. And we called her in Ralph Bunch called a recess, a 10 minute recess. And the Arabs went into a different room in the building and um, the Zionists went into another room. And I went around to each group and I said, look, I, you know, remember, this is just a game. Um, et cetera, et cetera. And the other thing is you really do have to um, have, uh, part of uh, the prep is talking with the members of all teams um, and sort of giving them the heads up. And I spend a great deal of time meeting one-on-one -on -one with many of the, the, the students outside of class. Uh, and I definitely meet with Al Husseini and I say, look, it's gonna come up that you were, uh, if not a Nazi, a Nazi sympathizer. And there's a picture of him with Hitler that always shows up. It's a famous, infamous picture. And so I say, you know, you're going to have to be aware of that. Um, and then we sort of have a, uh, a rules of the game talk at the beginning of every game. Say so there are some ground rules here and here are the ground rules. Um, you, you know, racist arguments are, are, are unacceptable, um, et cetera. And so you, you just got to try to manage it before the game. And then if it comes up during the game, um, I used Ralph Bunch uh, on several occasions to call recess, call timeouts to let everybody cool down. And and what you know, and I had one incident that scared the light, you know, that scared scared me to death. Um, the Arabs brought in a poster one day, and the poster said, um, "Zionism is the new Nazism." And then when they walked into class, I went to Ralph Bunch and I said, "No." that cannot we can't have that and so ralph bunch went to them and said you can't bring that into class and forced them to to tear it up and throw it away so i thought that crossed the line and had to intervene but it's definitely a challenge and this is a challenge of any kind of role-playing game um you know any games that have race or or sex or class or ethnicity you know you have this issue in the india game where Hindus and Muslims end up hating each other. Um, so it's definitely a challenge. Mark Carnes made a comment to me. You know, he said, I'm at Barnard, a lot of Jewish students. Um, and he said, if I was playing this game at Barnard, he said, I would make all of my Arab students be Zionists and I would make all of my uh, Jewish students be Arabs. <laughs> so I said, okay, well, you know, that's, I guess, one approach, but. Okay, thank you. Um... It sounds like Ralph Bunch is a pretty useful resource too. Ralph Bunch is a key player in the game. Yeah. Oh, the other thing I'll say is that one of the rules is, is I do not allow students to take pictures or, or do any audio video in class with their phones. Okay. Yeah. And I, and I just say, and I explain to them why I talk about it as a FERPA violation of other students' privacy. I kind of scare them a little bit and say, and I, and it's true. I've talked to, um, I've talked to university attorneys who say, you know, there's a case to be made that if, if a student, takes a picture in class of other students and posts it on social media or whatever, there's a case to be made for a FERPA violation there. Um, and so I share that with the students and I say, just don't do it. You know, it's not appropriate and it ruins the learning environment. So that helps a little bit. Okay. 
Um, so, and then we had um, sort of some follow-up comments from Lucy um, that the uh, the racism and um, uh, call-out culture and all of that that it may be and it may always be an issue with this topic on some level, but that it seems yeah. like it would be exacerbated with the role-playing aspect. And I think that um, your answer, um, I guess, kind of expanded on that too. Um, yeah, I will say I've only you know I've played it in two two classes and then also at the winter workshop and I, and I could be, maybe I'm, this is Pollyanna, but I felt like after, at least, especially at Georgia Southern in my classes, after the games were over and the debrief and I'm, you know, discussing with students, I felt like <laughs> they all sort of said, Oh my gosh, I don't know what to think about the situation. What a mess. It's so hard. Both sides have strong arguments. Both sides have made mistakes, but it's sort of a both sides position is where they landed. I don't I didn't have any students who came away and said, yeah, you know, Israel's awful or anybody come away and say, wow, yeah, the Palestinians are a bunch of terrorists. It was the it's that wasn't the experience I had. It was the opposite. It was every, most of the students at least who shared said they almost felt paralyzed. That was the real challenge I think as the students after the game felt completely paralyzed by the situation. Like, oh my gosh, it's hopeless almost. So, that's that's actually another challenge. Maybe I should have listed it, but Okay. Um, a few comments about Wikipedia. So um, <laughs> we have we have um, also from Lucy. She said, "Librarian here. Wikipedia is a good place to start, but a bad place to finish." Yes. And then Jeff also said um, he said he used to teach a course where he'd introduce Jurgen Habermas to students, and that the Wikipedia article was far more understandable than the English translated text on him. So they would oh. go there first. Yeah, that that line uh, is exactly the line I use. Wikipedia is a great place to start, a terrible place to finish. And so um, that's a, that. Yeah, so I actually was I, I do a quick sort of mini um, mini unit on, you know, information literacy. And we do have a discussion about that. So, yeah, it still terrifies me, though. <laughs> I've been to a lot of really good um, conference presentations on Wikipedia too. I think that it's I think that as long as you understand it, it, it can be useful. Yeah. The other thing that happens in the game is really I'm just giving them a very basic uh, set of, you know, basic amount of information to get them started. Really what they'll end up, what they end up doing is they end up going off and, and doing their own research for their characters or, or whatever. And, and so that makes it better. You know, they're not just relying on what Wikipedia says because, you know, they'll want to win. That's the cool thing about this game, about games is they get motivated to win. And so they end up doing a lot of their own research. Um, and so that that makes me a little more comfortable with this. It's just a place to start for them. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then uh, uh, relating back to the in it, the first challenge, um, uh, Dr. Akwonka, Akonkwo um, mm -hmm. says, I agree, this course could be very challenging due to tribalism, but mm -hmm. this course could be very informative, especially detailed and in-depth discussions. You've done a great job. And I agree. Oh, thank you very much. It was, um, yeah, I still get nervous, you know, thinking about it <laughs> because it, it can... It is such a challenging topic, and the and the tribalism is 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 a seriously complicated, thorny issue. Yeah, or yeah. set of issues, I should say. Um. So we are. I'll, few... I'll, I'll say one quick anecdote. When okay. when this when we played this game at the at the reacting winter conference at UJ, it was all professors, and some of them were you know subject matter experts. And watching them play the game was very fascinating because it was very different kind of a game than when the students play the game, you know. <laughs> and so, um, you know, the the professor who uh, uh, played Amin al Husseini handled that character so well. It was like, oh, I could exhale because I was just, you know, and it came out in the game, you know, you're a Nazi. Why should we even listen to you? So anyway, it was very interesting to watch professors who are subject matter experts play the game versus students who don't really know that much so yeah um we have one more we have another question that just came in um from dr larkin um mm -hmm. did you have any students recognize their own bias after the game was over meaning any bias they had prior to starting the game oh yeah absolutely um absolutely you know most of our a lot of our students i'm probably most um are christians and probably were pro-Israel coming into the game. And I think by the end of the game, um, they had a more sympathetic 
nuanced, complex view of the situation. And um, I think they come away from the game thinking, you know, you know, I'm, and I don't want to put words in students' mouths, but I'm in, and I'm inferring, but a lot of students think, oh, you know, Muslims are terrorists, and and or this is a this conflict is about is a religious war between Muslims and Jews, and what they come away with realizing is, wow, this is a complicated geopolitical, you know, game. And they the other thing they realize is the United States has had an important role in the conflict um, through our foreign policy, and that is often an eye opener uh, for the students is they'll like, wow, I didn't realize, you know, now I can see why maybe, you know, some Muslims hate us, you know, students will th say things like that. Um, and so that, that, that's my uh, anecdotal uh, inference is that most of the students at the beginning of the game are relatively pro-Israel and they have a, a sort of superficial uh, uh, conception that it's a it's a religious war between Muslims and Jews, um, but they come away they came out of the game thinking that wow this is a complicated situation it's really not that much about religion it's about land and territory and geopolitics through the UN and the U.S. foreign policy has played a you know an impactful role and so I think that's where the growth happened. But again, I will say I some of them I they almost had like existential dread you know, after the game, like, oh my gosh, this is hopeless. So I also, we had to have, we had to have a conversation about that and talk about, you know, some initiatives that are going on in the world to try to come up with solutions. And, and so, um, yeah. Thank you. Um, sure. Right, right now we don't have any more questions and we are a few minutes over, but um, I, I'll leave it up to you, Lana, if you want to um, ask if there are any other questions before we end. Okay. Well, how about this? Since we're over time, if anyone has any questions or wants to continue the conversation, just feel free to reach out to me at any time. Um, I'll go back here. My email is dsloan at georgiasouthern.edu. Okay. Thank you. We have a couple of people who are typing. Um, okay. Sure. I can hang around. Um, Lucy says, thanks so much. This was great. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording. Uh, and uh, Jeff also said, thanks, everyone.